So I have some good news and some bad news, as the old saying goes. Uh, the bad news is that in this year, 2024, we humans are far from anything like sustainable development. I think you all know what the challenges are, and they are profound. Our 150-year project of industrial modernity, for all its breathtaking achievements, is in deep trouble. It's clear that profound changes must happen and will happen, uh, either on our terms or else on terms that are very disagreeable to us, so we need to act. Uh, the good news is that we are now able to see, for perhaps the first time in human history, what we must actually do to navigate the daunting transition ahead. We can see it because we now have the scientific understanding of the true nature of our challenges and the tools we must deploy to meet them. For all our challenges, I do believe this is a wonderful time to be alive. And many people say that we're on the frontier of a new industrial revolution, and I do believe that. But it's a revolution, I think, that is set to transform the very definition of industry and the very definition of technology. It could, in fact, offer us a new renaissance, and let's hold that thought. The world will certainly be transformed by artificial intelligence. We've all seen the discussion here today. But even more profoundly, by what artificial intelligence reveals to us about the nature of intelligence and the structure of nature uh, and human nature uh, and the nature of cities. And that's what I want to uh, explore with you today. My own focus is on cities and on the role they play in creating both our challenges and our opportunities. After all, it's in cities that we move about, uh, interact, create, consume resources, and generate most of our ultimate impacts upon planet Earth. So we need to get this right. And yes, some of that will involve deploying new technologies since we have always been a technological species. But more deeply, we will need to transform our understanding of what cities are and what cities must become. To be clear, I do believe this is a threshold of a great new era, uh, not only extending our technology, but transforming it in fundamental ways. Uh, here is the marvelous Webb Space Telescope, an astonishing technological feat, a million miles away from the Earth, uh, deployed flawlessly. Um, and it's given us profound new insights into the nature of the universe. And by the way, there are two of these. This is the Euclid Space Telescope. And using similar technology, we may need to deploy solar shields to reduce solar heating uh, and protect the biosphere from the worst ravages of climate change. But adding ever more technology to failing technology won't help us if we don't address the deeper nature of the challenge. And more deeply, we will need to understand and exploit the technologies of living systems, the ways they can generate astonishing diversity, beauty, resilience, and sustainability. And these are the revolutionary new insights coming from the sciences. And you heard the reference to nature-based solutions earlier. And those living systems include the living systems of the human brain and the way it creates deep networks of knowledge and awareness. And neuroscientists call this the connectome, and it gives us the picture of the world that we see, and it provides our intelligence and even our consciousness. This structure gives us our ability to tell or to pick out what's going on in the world. It is the reliable mental model that our brains build, not perfect, but useful, uh, as we learn about the world. And this is the secret of human intelligence. And it's the secret of artificial intelligence, uh, the structure known as a neural network. As you all know, there's a lot of excitement about AI right now and considerable worry too, as there should be, about how this technology will be used or perhaps how it will use us if we're not careful. Uh, but there are two key points that I wanna make about AI. Uh, first is that it has the ability to assemble vast hyperlinks, web networks of data or knowledge. And second, it has the ability to evolve and grow more intelligent over time by itself, the way a child does. And this is known as self-organization, and it's a fundamental property of biological systems. 
in the process, the knowledge or the data is interconnected into these vast clusters of web networks, and they grow and get more and more deeply interconnected over time with ever more uh, connections forming deep networks, or we could say deep nets for short. We could contrast those with what we might call shallow nets with few deep connections, maybe because they're too new or they have other problems, and I'll come back to that very important point. Now here's an amazing thing. The natural world is full of these deep net structures from genetic codes to the structures of proteins to ecologies and much else. And human language also has this deep net structure as we can see here in a beautiful piece of poetry or in the linguistic knowledge represented by say an encyclopedia with many deep connections between the different topics. And as we saw, the brain itself has this deep net structure in the way it creates deep networks of knowledge and awareness. And here's another amazing and wonderful thing. Cities also have this deep net structure. The spaces of a city also form a very complex adaptive web network, a deep net at large and small scales. And cities also learn, in effect, and incorporate intelligence about how to make a successful and desirable place to live. Uh, now, this idea may seem a bit abstract, so let me give you a concrete example. This is a montage of a fairly ordinary London street around the corner from where I used to live, as it happens. And you can see many private rooms, but also more public room-like spaces, uh, the little spaces created by terraces or balconies or the sidewalk frontages of buildings. And these room-like spaces are connected to each other in some ways and often not connected in other ways. We can see but not hear through the glass or hear but not see through the hedge uh, and so on. And everything is interconnected ultimately to uh, the street and to the public realm. And this place network is very complex and it is evolving and self-organizing over time as people make small adaptations to control their desired level of contact and privacy. They do things like close windows and open doors and over longer spans of time they make major remodels or new buildings entirely. And as you can see here, when I went back five years later, it's fascinating how it's changed. New businesses and new paint colors, but also new kinds of spaces. Terraces above, a new stoop in front of the door below, and so on. These place networks are evolving. And the same thing happens at even larger scales over longer periods of time, as you can see here in the example of Venice over about a century. This is a drawing by the Italian architect and morphologist Saviero Muratori, and you can see the remarkable transformation and articulation of spaces in this one section of Venice over about 100 years or so. Um, and it transforms and articulates right down to the ornamental details, developing into this rich, complex city that we all know and love today. And a similar bottom-up transformation happens in the natural world where termites and other insects lay down chemical signals that they then use to build up highly sophisticated structures that control the temperature of their nests and do other important things. A really fascinating topic. Um, this is a phenomenon known as stigmergy, and it's not controlled by a central authority. It's a process of self-organization. And yes, we humans do something similar in cities. We lay down information in our environment, patterns that then shape further activities, further patterns, uh, compounding into the rich emergent patterns of urban life that we all know and love. And as the neuroscientists are finding, beauty, or what we experience as beauty, is also an important form of information, telling us this is a good place, we will be well here, we can thrive here, and perhaps we will care more for that beautiful home and sustain it for longer. So I suspect that you can see now that, like brains, cities too can embody a deep form of intelligence, embodied intelligence, if you will, a deep net structure. And they can evolve and learn to be smarter about how to provide a place where people can thrive. Now this new understanding of how cities really work, historically new, is still not well embedded into our modern systems. Uh, the remarkable journalist Jane Jacobs gave us an early account in the early 1960s when she described the organized complexity of cities. 
And around that same time, the architect and theorist Christopher Alexander also pointed out that a city is not a tree. It's not a simple tree-shaped hierarchy. It's rather an interconnected deep net. Alexander's insight formed the basis of his pattern language methodology, which turned out to have surprising usefulness of all things in the world of software, the world of design patterns as they're referred to. And that led directly to surprising innovations in game design, the development of Wiki and Wikipedia, uh, Agile methodology, and many more innovations. Now, you may remember the deep net structure of Wikipedia that I touched on earlier. So it's not a coincidence that many AI systems use Wikipedia and other similar large language data sets to generate very useful accounts of the world. Uh, they all exploit this deep net structure that I'm describing here. So it seems there's a similar deep net structure in the way economic expansion occurs in cities. Uh, So-called knowledge spillovers connect diverse people uh, within the public realm. And Jane Jacobs wrote about this in detail, suggesting that it was key to the so-called agglomeration benefits of cities. And this is a very important uh, phenomenon, I think. And this deep net structure also seems to be the key to the surprising resource efficiencies of cities, especially the more compact and walkable ones. They work not unlike ecologies to maximize outputs while reducing and even regenerating resources. And this was also a crucial point that Jane Jacobs made uh, near the end of her life when she spoke of the coming age of human capital, uh, expanding human development while reducing and renewing natural resources, um, an economy of repletion rather than depletion, you might say. And that is surely a key feature of the coming transition and a hopeful goal of great importance, I think. So, where does this leave us in thinking about the cities of the future? For one thing, I think it tells us to be very skeptical of mechanical, fantasy-based images of yesterday's future that have their roots in the wasteful consumption patterns of the early 20th century, well before our more recent scientific understanding of the deeply interconnected structure of nature and human nature and human cities. These approaches have not lived up to the fantasies. In fact, they've left us with a legacy that is, in a word, unsustainable. For another thing, the sciences have now revealed to us the formerly hidden collective intelligence embodied, remember that word embodied, in the great cities and buildings of the past, the information, the intelligence. It's not the images of these places that we should imitate in some fashion today. Rather, it's the deep knowledge, the deep patterns that they embody, uh, the deep nets that we can regenerate anew as a kind of DNA of place, if you will. I think this knowledge is very helpful in other ways too. Uh, we can now see the danger of what I earlier referred to as shallow nets uh, that we might say are clogging up the world and making us dangerously unintelligent. And you might say there's a counterpart to artificial intelligence and that is artificial stupidity. We had better watch out for that, I think. Um, they're producing very damaging outcomes and dysfunctions in areas as diverse and seemingly unrelated as destructive social media, fake news, political divisiveness, but also shallow image-based consumerism, the decline of critical institutions, market failures, choking bureaucracy, and unsustainable externality costs. All these trends sound very disconnected and disparate, but in fact, I think they have a common root and they all imperil our civilization and our future as a species. I think we can also see this problem in the specific dysfunctions of urban settlements. For example, the social isolation and the health impacts that come from sprawling, disconnected, and over-encapsulated urban forms. We cannot sustain the soaring externality costs that must be devoted to reconnecting people through automobiles and other machinery. Uh, that is high consumption, high depletion. And yet these are still dominant models of urbanization and, if you will, a toxic economic development even today. We need economic development, absolutely, but this is, if you will, the crack cocaine of economic development, a quick high followed by a planetary hangover. My friends, I think we have to transition to a more sound form of economic growth. 
That's one reason why the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and their cousin, the New Urban Agenda, are so focused on this topic of sustainable urbanism. It's now urgent that we reform our failing paradigm of contemporary urban development towards something less wasteful, more sustainable, uh, more life-supporting, and by the way, actually more livable and more enjoyable. And here, I believe, is the path to a true new urban renaissance, if we so choose. Meanwhile, there is the uneasy sense today that the world is growing uglier. Uh, but perhaps that doesn't matter, we think, if we can just address the functional problems. Um, unfortunately, that view is not consistent with new research from neuroscience and other fields, which suggests that our uh, experience of beauty or ugliness is intimately related to our need to find environments that are healthy and supportive of our own health and well-being. We're learning that these environments often exhibit forms of mathematical symmetry, not only the usual left and right bilateral symmetry, but rotational, translational, scaling, and also compound forms of symmetry. You all know about fractals and, and so on. And as Christopher Alexander showed, these symmetries emerge from the natural processes of healthy living growth, including the growth of cities. And when the growth of cities turns malignant, we naturally experience these places as ugly. This is what the science is beginning to show. When we are unable to experience a pleasing symmetry in our environments, say in a prison cell or in a bad building, evidence suggests that we may suffer a kind of symmetry deficit disorder, as my colleague Nikos Salingros and I have uh, described it. So these and other new scientific insights offer us some very helpful new tools and strategies, some lenses, if you will, to reform our mistakes and to transform our cities and towns into more flourishing, beautiful, sustainable, and just places, ready to play their role in the great transition ahead. And the new tools include new and better kinds of urban codes, more supportive of informality uh, and healthy growth. They include new economic mechanisms that can better value the growth of human capital while also valuing the reduction of externality costs, uh, including the depletion and emission of our critical resources. Um, there are promising new models. I'm sure many of you heard about the 15-minute city, uh, the new urbanism, uh, and ISA benefit urbanism, the title uh, that was used for this section. The idea of ISA benefit urbanism is that the city is a kind of carpet uh, that interconnects us all, and the more we are all interconnected, the more we all benefit. Social justice is also good for everybody's bottom line. It's not only a matter of justice, although it is that too, of course. And the new tools incorporate, as well, the timeless understanding of the great human places and placemaking around the world and throughout history. This is an immense treasury that we can tap into. Uh, and we now see that these places embody rich complexities, and they allow us to see today from the mathematics and other sciences new insights that we're gaining into exactly how profound and how sophisticated in many ways these places are. They are ancient to be sure, and yet they are also at the cutting edge of modernity and its challenges in so many ways. And so too is our understanding of them. And by the way, here are several entirely new settlements uh, generated on those ancient patterns by chat GPT-4. You all heard Sam Altman this morning. Uh, looks a little like this beautiful complex, actually. Um, so there's much more to do to develop and apply these lessons through research and dissemination of practical knowledge. And that's one key goal of the new REV Institute, uh, a center at the new Sorbonne, Dubai. So I want to close on this line. I talked about the deep net structure of poetry earlier, and I think it's fitting to close with this very wise uh, passage from T.S. Eliot. Perhaps when it comes to the cities of the future, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you.